Um, hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all. My name is Vinnie, Vinnie de Jong, um, and I'm here to uh, tell you all about what Python is and why I think uh, journalists and especially data journalists should use it. Um, it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be, I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to meeting you all. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation, please just ask the question. Um, if it's inconvenient timing, I'll let you know and I'll get back to it. Uh, you can ask your questions in the chat, but you can also simply unmute yourself um, and ask me uh, your question directly. Um, yeah, so let's just get started. My name is Vinnie. Like I said, I work at the Dutch National uh, Public Broadcast. Um, the company is called NOS, uh, and there I work as a data journalism, a data journalist at the economics desk. Uh, uh, that's for about a year and a half. And before that, I used to work at the national desk. And I think it's a really wonderful place to work because I get to do like the breaking news stories related to data, but also my own data driven investigations, uh, for which I use Python quite often. Uh, so I'm here to tell you about Python and the programming language. What is it and why use it? Um, because I have not met you before. I'm assuming you maybe have heard about it, but I'm, uh, but you don't have any prior knowledge. Um, so I tried my best to make sure everybody can can follow along. Um, if it's either if I go too slow or go too fast, just let me know so I can adjust accordingly, though you are with many, so it's going to be hard to, to uh, suit all of you. So uh, bear with me. So um, these are the three things I want to do. Um, I'm going to tell you all about Python. Then I want to show you two examples, hopefully some more. Uh, and the now what part um, I'm going to do online on Twitter, uh, but I'll add the link to that uh, in the description. So you'll know where to go if you decide to learn Python and to uh, uh, use Python or add it to your toolbox on your data-driven journalism journey. Um, so the first thing I did when I was asked to do this presentation was go to Wikipedia and see what the, the website had to say about Python. If you go there, the website will tell you Python is an interpreted high level general purpose programming language. And I was like, well, thank you very much, Wikipedia. Now, if I'm new to all this, I don't really know anything at all. Um, so here's my translation of this sentence. Um, I think um, a, high, a, a high level general purpose programming language. I think that means that Python is for one, a programming language. It's a language, it has a syntax, it has a grammar all the parts, just like English, just like every other language. Um, high level, uh, according to me, I would translate it as being more easily readable for humans, more easy to write for humans, but harder for a computer to understand, which means it's accessible uh, to many people, even if you don't have an engineering background. And then, uh, general purpose programming language, well, that just means it has many use cases and you can use Python to program websites or um, to do data science or use it for data journalism as I do, uh, and many, many more things that I probably am forgetting right now. Um, so all in all, <laughs> I'm so sorry, there's a the, there's a dog barking outside and they it only started when this presentation started. Um, all in all, this means that Python is a, um, uh, is a programming language that is accessible because it's so readable for, for most people um, and it's designed that way. So that's, it's not by accident. The, the guy who developed Python, Guido van Rossum, a Dutch programmer, actually aimed for the best possible readability. And it has many use cases. It's it's very for a very versatile language. Um, so I think that's for now the most important thing to know. Um, then, especially the the design for readability, 
I think is, is just simply amazing. Uh, so there is this thing called the Zen of Python, and it's basically the philosophy of the programming language in around 20 sentences. Um, the link is in this uh, presentation. So if you want to read the whole thing, um, you can, because I'm going to share these slides. Um, and I just picked some of the lines out of the Zen of Python because I think it's important to understand the philosophy of the tool you're using, especially if it's such a versatile and a tool uh, as the Python language is. Um, it stated that simple is better uh, than complex. Oh, I see some people. Hey, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, we're having trouble. Apparently attendees are not seeing your shared screen. Okay, some people do. Um, everyone, you might want to make sure that your view is set uh, on side by side with speaker or that you're able to see both. There we go. Problem solved? Yes. Okay, cool. I think. Okay, um, so as I was saying, Luckily, no image heavy, heavy image based content so far. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, there is this thing, it's called the Zen of Python, and it's basically the philosophy behind uh, the programming language. Um, and I think, uh, and I just picked some, uh, some of the lines out of this document. Um, oh, what's happening? Mm. So I picked, yeah, so I picked some of the lines out of this uh, document. For one, simple is better than complex, which seems like such an open door, but there are so many programming languages that by default make things a little bit complex, like every line has to end with a semicolon. Why? Well, nobody really knows anymore, but that's just how, how they do it. Um, there's no such thing uh, in Python. It's designed to uh, replicate uh, the English language language and uses no semicolons whatsoever when they're not when they don't make sense. Uh, and then complex is better than complicated. This is it's almost like a philosophy. It's some quite something to chew on, but I think it's um, if this is the basis on which you build a programming language, then these uh, principles will show um, in any everywhere in the tool, you'll find that when there's a simple way to do it, then that's the py most likely the most Pythonistic way to do it. Um, some other, um, some, I don't, I'm missing some of my slides. <laughs> and I think they're right behind here. So another principle is explicit is better than implicit. Um, which means that if something goes wrong in your code, then Python will tell you, oh, there's an error going on. This is what I know about it. Um, and it will, and it will, it will lower the barrier uh, to get started and actually work on something in Python because the language tries to communicate. Your tool tries to give you decent feedback that you can actually work with. Um, so I think that's a wonderful principle to, to have and base a, a programming language uh, on. Also, uh, error should never pass in silence, it should never pass silently. So uh, when you program in R, uh, for example, sometimes the language or the tool will just give you an update. We're doing fine, everything is amazing. But then it's printed in this caps all red letters. That looks like a warning to me, right? And Python tries to uh, makes uh, tries to use some more sensibility in in these matters. And I think when you're starting out and you uh, uh, yeah you need you need these kind of help you need you need this kind of help you need these kind of things making your life easier figuring out why things don't work why or or what's going on. And I think it's wonderful that Python in that sense actually tries to be your friend. Um, by basing everything off the Zen of Python and uh, thinking of readability as the most important thing. So I think that's wonderful. Um, 
I think every slide with an image is not loading, um, which is too bad, but not a big problem. Um, let me see. So uh, we went using Python for data science. I think the Python programming language, like I said, it's very versatile. Uh, but when using it for data science, there are some tools that are really making uh, Python an amazing uh, uh, tool. Um, so you have the versatile big programming language, um, but then within that language, there are libraries and packages that, that you can use for, uh, and that are really like good at one special thing. So Python is, is your work, is your work uh, area. And then, uh, for instance, pandas or NumPy or um, one of the other packages, those are like a hammer and a saw. And the, the tools you use within uh, that working environment, which is Python. And I think for data science, there are really, really wonderful, good uh, packages and libraries available. Um, so th yeah, that's really good. Again, because it's so, because the language is so accessible, uh, it's used by many scientists. So there is a really big community, a lively community that uses these tools, that develops those tools and keeps on developing the tools for, for the time being. And I think that's really important because if you run into a problem, you're probably going to be the millionth person to have that problem. So you Google it, you find an answer because people share their solutions and they share what they learn about the language. So I think that's wonderful and also, um, yeah, a win for Python that there's such a lively, big community for Python in general, but also for Python using it for data science. And then within that area, like the small little niche for using Python for journalism. Um, I'm gonna try, let me see. So on my phone, I'm looking at this wonderful image a cartoon about Python and R. I'm sorry you can't see it. Um, but um, when using uh, Python for, for data journalism, uh, a lot of beginners ask me, why use Python instead of R? And actually, R is, is fine too. And there are many things that both Python and R can do. Uh, personally, I use Python more often. Um, I'm better at it. But then again, I do it more, I use it more. So uh, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy, I guess. Um, but there are many things, many data analysis that you can do in Python, you can also do in R. So how do you pick one? Well, R is developed as a statistical language. Um, so it's a, it's a language um, written and developed for, for, st for using it for st st statistics. Python is uh, a general purpose language, so that's a big difference. You can make, you can hack with R and make a, build a website with it, sure. Um, but Python is actually meant to also be able to be used to build a website. And I think that's a, that's a big difference. Um, and then uh, there's accessibility. I think R has come a long way, but then again, the entire language uh, of Python is built on this idea that re readability and accessibility is very important. Um, but that is less so with R. So those are the, I think, the biggest differences. Um, there are some more. And of course, if you talk to somebody who uses R all the time, uh, they very likely can, um, uh, can talk you into using R more often. Um, I use Python mostly because when I started out, I was like, well, if data journalism is not my thing, then I wanna, I'm want i gonna take my skills onto something else and do something else. And then learning a general purpose language makes more sense. Um, so that's how I came to learn Python. And once you're in the Python universe, I think it's hard to get out. Um, okay, so Python for data-driven journalism, because I think Python for data science um, is really wonderful. Uh, but in my experience, the data journalism that I do only um, 
explores like a really small part of the Python for data science universe because if you I don't need it for the stories I try to make. So when making a data journalism story, um, you obviously I usually start by a story idea um, or something we'd like to investigate, a question we have. Then we go collect the data. I say we, but you're looking at the entire data team. So I go collect the data. Uh, Python is wonderful for that. It's you can use Python to scrape uh, data, and it works wonders. I'll show you an example uh, later on. Uh, then once I have the data, I need to most likely need to clean it. So then there's that. Uh, I try to do that in um, Python 2 because it's easier than I have everything in one, one place, one workflow, all the same tools. Then I do my data analysis. I'll use Python for that too. And when necessary, I'll visualize my data. Um, and Personally, I visualize my data as part of the analysis. Sometimes you need to see a chart to make sense of all those numbers. Uh, and I'll do that within Python, within my workflow. Um, but the uh, data visuals that I that we that NOS publishes are mostly not making in Python. Um, it has to do with the technology of our website and our web app. So it's not really. Um, uh, it doesn't make sense time-wise to use Python for it because it would be uh, it would take much longer. And there are really good visualizations tools out there. So I usually export my data, like the data I need for a visual, import it in another tool, and and make a visual there. Uh, but you can very well make uh, data visualizations in Python. I just think it's um, it can be harder if you want to make interactive beautiful, user-friendly uh, stuff, but it uh, very much can be done. I just personally don't know how to do it or not well enough to, uh, to go for it when I'm on a deadline. Um, but the entire process can be done in, in Python. Uh, so yeah, that's why I use it. Um, I'm gonna talk about my workflow later. First, I would like to say Python is not like if you if you just got yourself a new hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Isn't there a saying like that? Like you know this new you have this new skill or this new power, and now you want to use it for everything. But you, I feel very much that you got to be smart about it. Python is not the best answer for every data analysis question you'll have in your data journalism career. If you have a millions of if you have millions of rows, you might want to use a database, uh, consider using uh, SQL um, because I think that's the better tool for it. But then again, it's a different tool. So you of course have to know how to work with it. Um, and if time is important, if you're in a hurry, then maybe you don't want to program uh, because for a lot of my stories, I do one investigation and I make whatever I'm making to get to the data or to get to the story. I most likely am going to use it only once. And sometimes it's faster um, to use an out of the box uh, tool to scrape a website using Outwit Hub uh, because then uh, it, can be, it can be done faster and I get my data set faster. And then I can, of course, do my analysis with Python if that's the, if those, if that's the fastest tool for me. Um, or if it's a really small data set and I'm collaborating with another journalist who doesn't really know Python, um, but who is handy with Excel, then it makes sense to do that analysis in Excel only. So your so my colleague uh, knows what I've done and can see and understand the work that I'm doing. Uh, so we can truly collaborate better. So I think, yes, Python is wonderful. There are many advantages of using it for data journalism. And I think if you wanna be in data journalism, uh, for a long while, I think it's smart to learn how to program, though it's not necessary. You can be a very good data journalism with data journalist without knowing how to program. Um, uh, but it's if you if you're gonna start on this journey, I feel, uh, yeah, think of what's the most important thing uh, and the and the boundaries you have to work within. And in journalism, in my experience. 
uh, the boundary, the first boundary is always my deadline uh, and the lack of time. Uh, so I try to really think about that. And if there's another two that's faster, then I'll go for it. Most of the time it's Python, but it's not always just saying. Um, again, a slide with an image. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so I wanted to uh, show you a couple examples. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to, I figured I was going through this presentation and when I came to my original next slide, I was like, I'm using all these lingo that I never addressed before. So maybe I should take one slide to talk you through it. Um, an image that works. Um, Penny, so sorry to interrupt you. We had a question about the tool you mentioned earlier. Was that Outwit Hub? Can you confirm? Yes, Outwit Hub. Yes. Thank you. I think um, Outwit Hub is a really uh, wonderful tool to scrape something when you don't know how to program, but you're not afraid of looking at the source code of a website. So, um, yeah, that's an entire talk. In a, it's the tool itself. It's a word of talk, really. I think there is a book out there by Paul Bradshaw. Um, I'm not a sponsor. Um, I don't think the book is free, and I don't think it should be. And I think the book is called Scraping for Journalists. Um, um, and it's a really great resource. And it, it also in part goes on how the how to scrape using Outwit Hub. Uh, the software itself has a very fairly good tutorial, um, and it is a freemium product. So there is a free edition, and I think there is a limit that you can scrape only so many hundreds or so many thousand rows, uh, but quite a lot. Um, in my uh, that's how I remember it, but I haven't used the free version in a while. Um, and then there are premium versions and they get quite expensive really fast, but the cheapest one is, I don't know, I think less than a hundred euros, dollars, um, which is quite some money, but if you use it often, I think it's worth it. And I also think that, um, yeah, if your newsroom has, has that kind of uh, money to spend, um, Outwit Hub will, yeah, will be will be money well spent, uh, in my opinion. Um, switching back to my Python workflow, um, so the way I use Python, I use Python um, uh, as provided by Anaconda, uh, and here's why, and here's why, <laughs> basically. Um, I'm gonna use an analogy of painting your house. So let's say you have this beautiful living room, um, but you decide the all walls need to be a totally different color, um, but there's only so much space in your house. So, so you can't really remove all the furniture. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the plastic and wrap your couch in it and your chairs, um, um, uh, and protect everything that you that you want to that you want to uh, that you don't want to paint, right? Uh, then you bring out the tools. So you bring some brushes, your roller, your tape to keep everything safe and in place. Uh, and once that's done, you'll start painting the wall and everything that you want to go from white to blue or whatever you, colors you picked. That's what you're gonna work on. Uh, and I think that's. Uh, exactly what Anaconda provides. So when you download Anaconda, uh, you get what they call a virtual environment, which is basically uh, a taped off area on your computer where you can cause mayhem with your Python. But uh, if everything goes wrong, you just close the door, take, off, take, off, take down all the tape, all the plastic, and your computer is gonna be just fine. So that's the environment that Anaconda offers. There are many other ways to get uh, a virtual environment, but I think Anaconda is one of the easiest and most accessible ways. On their website, they have amazing tutorials on how to do it. Um, and in the Python for Journalists course that I did, that I made for datajournalism.com, the entire first 
episode is about how to get this on your computer. Um, then within such an environment, I try to create, um, I try to create an, um, what's the word? Uh, I create a, I make a Jupyter notebook uh, to write all my code in. Why a Jupyter notebook? Because it's interactive. Um, so basically a Jupyter notebook, I consider it to be like a digital, um, a digital roll of toilet paper. You can just start writing, it's endless. Uh, when your thinking evolves, because you have so many space, you can just keep on going. Um, when you change your mind, when you make a mistake, I just leave it all in there because the paper is endless and I can scroll back and see my notes and, and see my thinking evolve and really uh, get to the right method, uh, methods to, to do my analysis. Uh, and what this, and this I think is really important and a really, a really big plus for Python, but also Jupyter Notebooks for data analysis that you use for uh, journalism stories, because our methods have to be the best and very solid. Um, so, you know, you want to know, you want to know for sure when you publish. So when uh, using a Jupyter Notebook, and I'll show it to you in a minute, I'll show you one in a minute. Um, I can see my thinking, I can leave myself notes. I can be like, this you need to remember. Oh, I tried it this way, but it's not working because X and Y are, is in the data or the data is a little different than I first figured. And all those thoughts, all that thinking, which is actually the hard work, uh, I can read back. So if I work on a story today and come back next week, all my notes are gonna be there as will my code. Um, and when I come back to a story in a year, I can just open up, a, fire up a notebook, go to the story, read my own notes, read the code because it's so readable uh, and be like, oh, this is what I did. Yes, I wanna do that again. Uh, take other input data and I'm ready to go because it's all your information is very um, uh, much reproducible. Uh, so, so your entire workflow can be repeated which is wonderful if you need to verify and fact check your, your own work before publication. Um, so yes, that's, that's what I think is another plus for Python. Using it this way in this environment, it makes your uh, workflow very, uh, very easy to fact check. Um, and you can be, um, yeah, you can be your own best friend by leaving yourself the notes that you you are going to need a week from now or a year from now. Or, um, um, thank you, Tabitha. <laughs> um, but you can leave yourself the notes that you, you know you're going to need next time you come back to this story or this analysis. Um, so before I'm going to, I'd like to show you two examples um, and then open up to uh, questions and and uh, so you have plenty of time to ask your questions um, and if there are no questions I'm happy to show you some more examples um, so I work for the NOS which is a Dutch uh, broadcast company so I I figured let's show them um, the TV item but then it's all in Dutch so it doesn't really make sense um, so I'm just I'm gonna have to translate it for you. I think this is a really. But before I do, are there any questions at this moment in time before we dive into to a couple examples? I'm looking at the chat, but nothing there. No no questions. I figure. Okay. Well, let's get on with it then, Amy. Um. Um. Yeah, so I worked on this story, as you can see it's from May, 2018. And I picked uh, this old, an, one older example to prove the point that I can actually oh, fire up a Jupyter notebook, fire up my digital toilet roll um, and go back to the story and then understand my own notes and tell it to you. Um, this was a story I, I made with uh, Joost Gellepis, uh, 
a colleague at the NOS, um, and he has uh, he has a cat, as many people do, and that cat uh, needed to be chipped because well, when that cat runs away and somebody finds it, uh, they'll look for a chip. If the cat has one, then they can scan the chip, and then um, the veterinarian will see this cat belongs to Joost Schellevis, who then gets a call, you can pick up your cat here, and everybody lives happily ever after. So um, while talking to the veterinarian about the chip and looking into how the system worked, he noticed that um, the information was not secure at all. So basically, if you know a chip number and you go to the website, a uh, problem is solved by now. This is an old story. But you can you can go to uh, to this website, um, fill in your chip number, and then if you do fill in a chip number, if let's say uh, you find uh, find the cat, the veterinarian reads the number, then fills it in, and then you go to this page. I removed all the personal data, so those are the gaps. But you then get to see this is the number of the chip. The chip belongs to a cat. This is the race of said cat. The cat is a female. It has blue eyes. It was born in 2016. It was registered also in 2016. Um, apparently, this cat has a passport. I don't have pets, so I would know. There is this, there's no picture because I removed it. And then here is the owner info, like name, address, phone number, email, um, and the veterinarian that created this uh, registration. So uh, quite a lot of information. When looking into this, I saw little children with their pets in the picture. So, you know, it's private information. You don't want that out there. You want it, you fill it in because you care for your pet and not necessarily because you want the world to see that picture or to know your address and have your phone number. Um, so we ended up making a story uh, basically saying the data of pet owners, uh, the data of pets and their owners is just open to everybody. Um, we did a little uh, TV item with the, with Yo's cat, which was fun. Um, and it's, I think it's, it was a nice story because it stands for a bigger problem uh, that many many people don't think of. Um, but for now, to make this story, we had to prove that not just this one cat that I just showed you, uh, we could look up in the database, but that it was a structural error in the design of the database and that I could get the data of many, many pets and, and pet owners. Um, so looking at this, information, I was like, well, if I collect all these names and phone numbers of owners, then I'm, you know, I'm not in the clear myself. Uh, so we decided to only collect um, whether it was a cat or a dog. And if I'm correct, I think the color eyes, but we'll see. We'll see in a minute. Um, so this is a Jupyter notebook. If you launch one, just to show you, um, if you launch one, it will look like this. It's empty. I can type something here. Um, I can make it uh, read Markdown. Put the title in. Um, I can, you know, make a variable, start writing my code. Um, so the notebook that I'm going to show you is one that I created for this story. Here we are. I'm going to remove the sidebar so you can have a better view. So aantekening is Dutch for notes. Notes. Uh, what's, what's the story? This line says, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the story? Well, the story is, Website with pets and chip databases don't protect the data they have. To do, uh, write a scraper for this website, petbase.eu, 
Um, and then run the scraper from a digital ocean server because I'm collecting so much data. Uh, things to think about, another note for me, uh, don't save any private information, just save the code, uh, the name of the pet, uh, and the picture I have written because we figured it might be nice to have some images for television. But during my first test, I found so many children in those pictures that we never saved any pictures. So just the code and the name of the, uh, of the pet. So remember, this currently you're looking at this tape down part of my computer. Um, all this is written in Python. Um, and these are the tools that I'm importing into my work environment. So these are the brushes that I'm using to put smear Python on the wall and to give me whatever I need. First up, I'm using regular expressions, which is really handy to deal with text and to clean your text. Then I'm importing beautiful soup, which is a Python library used to, um, um, to, to rip up a website, just to be able to say, I only want the H1 of that website, or I only want to have the second paragraph of a website. You can do that with beautiful soup. So you can take parts out of a website. Then I'm importing CSV because I'm saving all my data to a CSV file. I'm importing time because I'm gonna do some timing. I'm gonna, I need a stopwatch. Um, and then I'm importing re request, which is another library from Python that is really good at requesting a website, hence the name. So I created a function. Um, and I think this is quite readable. So let me talk you through this. Um, Basically, what I want to do is I want to request the website, uh, this website, for as many pets as I can think of. Um, uh, so I have to, to pretend that I'm a computer. I have to fill in a number, right? Because it asks for a chip number. And then I'm going to take that website, get only the chip number, only save the chip number, and get the pet's name. So basically I'm, I'm getting, I'm requesting all this and then I'm telling, um, uh, and, then, and then I'm telling uh, uh, Beautiful Soup will only give me the name of the cat and nothing else. Um, this cat is named BB. So uh, that's the only part of this page that I wanna say. So that's what I'm trying to do in this function. Um, these headers, um, is me saying, pretend that I'm a Mozilla Mac website using Chrome. Go to this URL, um, because basically if you go to this URL you, and you add as the payload the number of the, of the chip, it gives you back the page that I just uh, showed you. Um, and then uh, once that's done, um, once you've done that, take out, collect the name, the, the color, um, and try to do that for, this is, I'm running a test here. So I created all these chip numbers that I knew existed. So try to do that for all these chip numbers to see if the machine that I'm writing is actually working. So here for every, so this is a list of chip numbers. My code here is like for every Y in chip numbers, for every number in this list of number, um, the, add the number to the payload and name it transponder, basically replace the XXX. Um, then request the website, tell the website, what payload, what data is in the payload, the chip number. Also, still, still try to pre still pretend that you're a, a, a Chrome user on a Mac. Um, then if that returns a valid website, a 200 status code, then save the response, save the text of the response 
in a variable that I call HTML, then create a soup. That's um, a default thing to do. And then from, from everything that, that is that web page, select the table. From that table, get the name. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying using regular expressions, uh, give me everything in between animal name and sort, which would be only BB. Um, so that's how I'm selecting the data. And I'm doing that for everything I, everything I wanna know, the sex of the animal, the, is it the, the kind of animal it is? Is it a cat or a dog? Um, and then I run this test and then here you see, because it's a test, I'm like print everything you got. Um, and, and people, there is a dog called Hercules and he has the color of chocolate. And uh, there is a cat um, who has the color of a schildpad, I don't know, of another animal. <laughs> and he's called Mao. And here is Bibi, the cat. Um, so that's how I uh, scraped uh, this data. And I think um, I left myself some comments. I documented my thinking. Um, so if I want to do this again, then I can act could actually do it again, except that this is a two, 2018, no, it's a, almost a four-year-old story. So by now the pet base, website has changed, so I probably would have to modify um, uh, this assignment to where to find the data exactly. Um, let me see. Um, I'm looking at some of your questions before moving on to the next. So if you have a question, drop it in the chat. I'm reading it right now. Um, how did you get onto this story in the first place? Um, like I said, my colleague, uh, Joost Gennefis, he's the, he's the tech editor and he was wondering how safe is my data going to be when I enter this form. So that's how we got to this story. And then, um, can this get around cap? Yes, it can. It can get around. Uh, I am human tests though. I would say that is not a project that I would recommend to a beginner. So I'm pretty sure if, if you know if you have the will to do it and you're smart, you can do it. Or no, just if you have the will to do it, it can be done. But I would not start doing that first. Um, uh, also, if there is a am I human test, that's probably there for a reason. And if a website is if a website owner created that, then they probably also created a robot.txt or some something somewhere that will tell you that you're not allowed to scrape that website. So scraping is in that sense um, a final a final tool like just call the guy who owns the site first and see if he will give you the data right or if there's a security in this case we are researching a security breach uh, maybe just give them a call and see what they have to say. They said there was no security breach. So that's why we, I ended up writing this, right? Because we figured there was, and it was a yes or no. So let's get us some data and prove it. So that's why I ended up um, writing this code. Um, uh, oh, another question, which is the best way to visualize the data once it's fully collected? Um, the best way or the best tool? I'm going to answer both. The best way, I would say there is uh, Smarana, maybe you could look it up, but the Financial Times has some has a tool, it's called a visual vocabulary. It's on GitHub. If you search FT and visual vocabulary, you should find it. Um, I'll share that with everyone in a second. And um, that's a tool that actually shows you if are you trying to compare things or are you trying to show location and then it will uh, give you forms of, vis of data visualizations that lend themselves very well for the purpose you have. 
So I think that's a new way to think about data visualization because when I have data, all my colleagues want a map, no matter what. But a map doesn't make sense if whatever you try to tell is not about location, right? If you try to compare things, maybe you just want a bar chart, which might be more boring, but also more efficient in, in trying to, do, in communicating whatever it is you want to say. Um, so the best way to visualize, I think the question as I understood it, that's, here's the answer. That's how I try to think about it. Um, and then the best tools. I think there are many great tools out there. My personal favorites for their ease of use and, and, um, and but also the versatility of the tools at the moment are Flourish. Um, I think the website is flourish.studio and uh, Data Rapper, who the tool that has been around uh, quite a, for quite a while now. And I like Flourish because it's very versatile and it allows, you, you can even program it yourself if you know JavaScript. I don't, um, but um, it can be done. Um, it's really fast. It's, it's um, yeah, but then, and it allows for more advanced um, data visualizations, interactive with some nice filtering options, stuff like that. Because of how, because of that, it's also um, not the easiest tool to learn because more options means more buttons and more things to fill in and, you know, um, uh, but I think it's, it's worth it. And then there's Data Wrapper, which has a lower entry bar, uh, but, but allows you to produce pretty amazing things. And if you know the nitty gritty of the two, you can really make some, some uh, uh, more complex visualizations. Uh, but what, um, so I, I actually, I really love that too. Um, but what I also love about Data Wrapper, the company, is that they have a very extensive website that includes um, like a data visualization academy in some sorts. So you, they document everything very, very thoroughly. And you can get an entire education in data visualizations by reading only their website. And then I think you're going to be pretty good off. You, uh, they also have a, a book club now, which I think is really fun. Though I always run out of time um, and always uh, am a little behind. Um, so those would be my favorite tools. But then again, when I'm in an analysis, I usually just whip up some code to get my analysis, to get my data uh, analyzed within the notebook. Um, I don't do any effort to make those visualizations look beautiful because they're just there for my understanding. Um, what level of JavaScript? There is no level of JavaScript required to start using Python. I think it helps if you know, uh, if you are familiar with programming in any other language, I think that helps because probably some of the concepts used in programming are universal. Uh, so some of the concepts you know and learn about JavaScript or R or whatever language, um, they're gonna be helpful when using, uh, when learning Python, but it's not a requirement at all, I'd say. I think, um, I think Python is so accessible that you could learn it even when you don't have any programming language experience at all. Uh, though I think the um, library that I use most for data analysis, which is called Pandas, um, it functions, functions in a way similar to uh, Microsoft Excel or spreadsheets in general. So if you have, if you are familiar with uh, Excel or with spreadsheets and you know, for instance, how to do a, a pivot table or you have filters your data before in, in a spreadsheet, have done uh, things like that. I think it helps when you try to learn um, Pandas because it will give you the luxury that you only need to learn the syntax of the language and the meaning of the words, but not the logic behind it or the concept of what you're doing. Um, so um, I think that 
will flatten the learning curve in a sense, because understanding what is happening to the data, you already done that using spreadsheets. So, so the learning curve is only about learning this new tool and not learning a new concept. Uh, David, I'm happy to send you any link, but can you please specify what links you want to get? <laughs> um, meanwhile, I'll read a, another question. Uh, how long do you think it takes to get good at Python or at least comfortable enough to implement it in your investigations? Um, um, that's a hard question. Um, let me see. I think, honestly, the scraper that I'm showing you right now is not a scraper that I began with. I think, I think you, there is a problem of good taste. Um, I'm gonna Google something for you. And the problem of, um, mm, what is it? Yeah, so the problem of the problem of good taste. Uh, the problem of good taste is that um, well the problem of good taste is that you are trying to get into data journalism or are into into data journalism you have a good taste, so you recognize good data journalism. You can appreciate the work that is done by the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, um, the Washington Post, and all the other outlets that are doing great, great wonderful uh, data journalism. But you yourself are still a beginner, right? So you have to bridge that gap between where you want to get and why you're into something and where you are at the moment. And the only way to bridge a gap is by doing the work. If you want to be a data journalist, you have to do, you have to make data journalism stories. Um, if you want to be the noun, you have to do the verb. It's as easy as that. And while doing it, you'll get better. And then at some moment in time, you wake up and you figured, I figure I won a data journalism award for a story. And I was like, oh, I think I somehow bridged the gap. But while I was doing it, I didn't really, really was thinking about bridging the gap, but I was bridging the gap. Anyway, Ira Glass puts it very well in this interview. I put the links in the, in the chat. Um, so the scraper that I just showed you is not the scraper that I began with. And it's not my first story that I used Python with. I'm just saying, I don't think it's possible to answer the question because when can you use Python for a story? I think fairly quickly. Um, if you're into it and if you're willing to, to, to learn it, I think you can. Some people might, I don't know, it depends what you know and, and how fast you, you can learn new things. I don't know. But I think in a couple of days, you know some Python to do a simple data analysis. And if you have a good topic that only requires a simple data analysis, you write yourself a story. Um, uh, but don't get discouraged by the problem of good taste because the only difference, the only reason why I'm doing the presentation and some of you are listening is that I began 10 years ago and you are beginning right now. And, it, and that's, that's all. I was where you are now or maybe I'm going where you are now. Um, but at least for most, I think I was where you were now, where you are now 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And my first scraper wasn't, my first scraper just downloaded the entire website and then I wrote something else to get the data out. And you just saw the combined, that combined in half the amount of code that I used the first time. So yeah, don't get discouraged by the problem of good taste. Now, some links to tools. I'll do that and then I'll show, um, I'll try to show the other story. Um, I like Data Wrapper. 
Um, did this answer the question about how long it takes? Not really, I guess, but it's an answer. And is it what you were looking for? Um, meanwhile, I'm looking at the other two. Another one is this one. Um, so, um, will you be sharing resources for self learning? Yes, I will. Uh, great, uh -huh. nice to hear. Yes, I'm coming back to the resources later. We are low on time, right? 15 minutes. I'm so about the resources to learn, I wanted to put that into the presentation, but I ended up not doing it because I ran out of time. So I'm going to make a Twitter thread and put all Python, learn Python um, resources in that thread. And I'm going to, and I'm going to, um, going to add the link to those tweets um, in the final slide in the presentation. So if you go to the website, the conference website and you download the uh, presentation, you will have th those links too. Um, and I'm also gonna ask some of my uh, Python programming uh, befriended data journalists to add their resources too. So it's not just me and my favorite things, but it's gonna be the favorite things of a few of us. Um, so yeah, just go to the, uh, also there is a Python learning resources at the network website too. That's a good one too. Um, yeah, but I'll, I'll make sure, if you download my presentation, I'll make sure that everything, all the links are in there. Um, even the links that I just shared in the, in the chat. Now, if there are any other questions, put them in the chat. Meanwhile, I'm firing up another example. Um, this example is more recent. It's, um, it's basically a COVID story in a sense. Um, in the, there was a lockdown in the Netherlands. Many businesses had to close down um, and, and the pandemic became both a health crisis, but also an, in some sorts, an economical crisis. So uh, the Dutch government decided uh, that the most important thing was for everybody to, to keep their jobs. Um, sorry, just taking a sip. Uh, the most important thing was for everybody to keep their jobs. So businesses that had a loss of income for instance, if you were a restaurant and you had to close down, you're not making any money, you're just losing money. You could then become, you can, could then ask uh, or get subsidy for the salaries that you kept on paying because you didn't fire anybody. Um, and the whole thing is called uh, an away stern, <laughs> basically salary support in a way. I think that's a, a good, uh, translation. Um, and um, yeah, so, 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 uh, um, so we wanted to know, as all other Dutch newsrooms, which companies are getting how many salary support? Um, and uh, so that's what we asked for. Um, and the part of the government that that was tasked by giving out the money and keeping this administration, uh, published um, a PDF with the information. Not fun. Um, so so the, uh, by now we have seen four rounds of this salary support. Um, there will be no more rounds because the economy is opening up uh, again. Um, but we, we've seen four rounds and the first round the government only published uh, PDF. Um, uh, so I had to get the data out of the PDF, collect the data, then do an analysis. 
and then um, tell the story, right? That's, that's what you want to do. So I'm going to show you some of the stories that we made based on this data, and then I'm going to show you uh, the thinking, we, like the, the, net, the notebook. So this is a story from last year, almost 20 million euros to uh, professional soccer clubs, uh, most to uh, a club called uh, PSV in the south of the Netherlands. Um, uh, then another one from this year, uh, uh, less than uh, 11, uh, less than uh, around 11 million to soccer clubs, which is 50% uh, less than, than last time. Then again, KLM, the flying company, uh, the biggest uh, receiver of uh, salary support. And we made this story like, most support goes to KLM. Again, most support to KLM. And I, I don't know, I think we made it three or four times. Um, 77,000 companies request, uh, um, request support. So, and these are just a few of the stories that were based on this data. Um, I'm not showing you all because they're very much alike. Um, let me show you what I did. So, um, no, let me, let me, so KLM, actually, if we think, if I think about KLM, if I, if my mom thinks about KLM, she thinks of one company, but in, um, on paper, there are many companies. There is KLM, the onboard food services. That's a separate company. There is KLM Cleaning. That's a separate company. Then there is KLM Flying to Europe. That's a flying within Europe is a separate company. So when we say KLM biggest re, biggest receive the most uh, support, uh, the people that our audience thinks of one company. But if you look at the paperwork, there is a list of companies. So um, then how, how do you decide which company received the most money if there's a difference in between the structure of the company on paper and the structure of the company in the people's mind, right? So uh, I went to the Chamber of Commerce, requ requested data on, on company structures. This is booking.com. And as you can see, every single one of these companies together are, are, are part of, uh, for, will form a bookings acquisitions company. Um, but every single one of these co companies based in Amsterdam can request comp um, salary support. So what I had to do is look for all these companies in my data set once I took it out of the PDF and then um, add those up. Because if the people are talking about booking.com, they don't think of distribution as a, different part of as a different company uh, than uh, IT services to the public it's all booking.com so uh, a big effort in this story was uh, how do we get the data to represent the companies in a way similar to how people think about companies um, so I had I downloaded these or I requested bold actually these PDFs from the chambers of commerce for all companies I'm just show, showing you one and then I'm using Python um, to get this information, like these lines out of the PDF. Um, why am I using Python? Because it's, um, so here's a list of all the PDFs that I had um, because there are many. And we wanted to make sure that if you come, if you uh, add up everything for, I don't know, a company like TUI Airlines, um, you you want to make sure that that if you say they receive the most, then you want to make sure that if you add it all up, that still holds, right? So here I'm reading the PDF. It's similar. It's another one, but similar to what you just saw. Here I'm getting all the text out of the PDF, and then I'm using regular expressions within Python to um, get the information that I really need. Um, and once I have that, here I have a list of all, no, I'm too, too soon. Here I have a list of 
all the companies that are part of the Sligro food group. Um, and then I can use this data set, look at the salary support that was given out and add it up at, at all the support received by one of these companies up into one number and say, this is the final, the total number of support, the total amount of support that Sligo Food Group got. As you can see, I have all these PDFs for all these companies. Um, and I figured we were like, we were in lockdown time. I figured we are, this pandemic is on the last. So I'm gonna be doing this. There's gonna be another round of salary support. And then I'm gonna be doing this again for other companies. So I used um, Jupyter Notebook to make sure my um, uh, workflow was reproducible. Because uh, as you can see, I'm starting out with, with these companies, but in, a, in the fourth round, there may have been other companies requesting support than in the first round. Uh, but I just add those PDFs for the new companies to my list, run my notebook again, and I end up with a new data set that includes the data from the new companies. I just changed my input, kept the same workflow. And that I think is a really strong suit of, of using Jupyter Notebooks uh, for programming. Um, can PDF files directly be read through Python? Yes, I'm importing PDF Plumber, which is actually a, a library developed by um, uh, uh, developed by a data journalist. I'm not, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna think about who made this and I'll look it up and I'll add it to the, to the list. Um, so you import a tool to read the PDF and get the data out. So in a sense, yes, it can be directly read through Python, but again, I'm importing a tool. Uh, it's not, ju not just Python, like somebody created this tool for us. Um, are there any other questions? Because we only have, I think, five or 10 minutes left. I don't think we're gonna be cut off, right? So we have some time. Um, okay, if you have, like we're nearing the end of these pre this presentation and I tried my best to uh, facilitate you and, and I try my best to imagine what you would wanna know when to, uh, to a session with that's named what is Python and why use it. Uh, but if you have any questions, drop them in the chat now. If I can't answer them here, I'll add the answer to the presentation. Uh, which you then can download from the resource uh, page, right? Um, this is the analysis of the, um, this is the data analysis uh, of the salary support data. Again, as you can see, I'm importing all these tools here. I'm setting up my environment. I'm making notes. What's, what's notes to sell? What's the goal? I need to create tables for four rounds of salary support. Um, I want to know the name of the company, the, the place that they, the city they're based in, the amount of money they already got, uh, the percentage of the total number that they got. Um, and then I'm reading in all the data, doing my analysis. I'm looking at the questions. What would be a good startup project for learning Python? I think a good starter project would be a data-driven story that you could do in a spreadsheet um, and try to do that in Python. Because like I said before, if you know, it forces you to learn spreadsheets first, which I think is smart. And then it forces you to you get to reuse your knowledge about the cons of the concept of data analysis and uh, pivot tables, for instance, um, and get and which gives you the luxury of only having to learn how to how to use those concepts in a new language, and not both learn new concept and a new language. 
also if you um uh if you if you do it this way you can check your own work by redoing the story in excel so you it allows you to actually be both the student and the teacher because that's basically if you're on your own out learning trying to learn this and there's not a coach a mentor a colleague who knows python then how are you going to be both the student and the teacher well this is how i got to be my own student and my own teacher um, I tried doing an analysis in Python and I checked if I did, didn't make any mistakes in Excel, which slows you down tremendously, but it also forces you to really learn uh, the tool because um, you already understand the data, so you only need to focus on how do you learn the tool. Um, and like I said, it's uh, called a programming language. It's because it is a language, so you're learning a new language here. That's hard and to be admired in and of itself. Um, so I would say a good starter project would be a story that is big enough to, to publish, right? Because I'm guessing you already work somewhere you want to publish. Um, but that is small enough that it could be done in, in, in spreadsheets um, and then do it, but then not do it in spreadsheets, do it in Python pandas. And I think that would be, because then the thing is, uh, I said it to the, the organizers of this session earlier. If you look at the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, or the, if you look at the big companies doing data journalism, you go from inspirational. And I really think, let me first say, I think they do amazing work, setting the bar really high. But if you look at it, if I look at it, I'm the single data journalist at a Dutch national newsroom. I go from inspirational to frustrational really really quickly because i look at it i'm like this is amazing i want to do it let's get to work i go to the newsroom i gather my team there is no team it's me i gather all my time there is no time i have things to do um i go to my editor i'm like in in a they did it in in two weeks with 30 people but i could do it in two years on my own he, i mean never gonna happen uh, so, 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 so start small, uh, and, and don't fall for the problem of good taste. Don't do it. Keep your good taste, but don't fall for it. Um, uh, can you share links for published stories, projects that you work on? Uh, yes, I will add some, uh, stories that I worked on, uh, to the presentation. Uh, though it's going to be Dutch, so you, you have to Google trade it. Um, what was the source for the Dutch salary support data? Uh, UFA, um, the part of government that, that uh, managed the, the, the money, that gave out the money to the companies. Um, I have a question I also had for R. Why use R Python for data analysis when you can also use Excel? What are the benefits? Uh, the benefits of R and Python over Excel is that Excel can only handle so much data. There is a limit to it, and the limit for Python and R is way higher. So uh, uh, I want to say a number, but I, um, I don't really know, remember. Uh, but let's say you can do 500,000 rows in Excel, and I think that's being really generous. Um, you could probably do a million in R or Python. So that's one. Second, um, reproducibility. If I do a data analysis in a spreadsheet, I, write, I literally physically write down notes to know next week what I have done to the data because there's no way to, sit, to see, to tell. If I use a notebook, I can leave notes to myself um, and I can, I can see my thinking evolve all, all through, throughout the process. So here I'm like, what is the percentage of money of salary support a company got in said period? So this foundation, Go and Tell, they got 0.000391% of all support given out in this, uh, in this first period. Okay, now how do I uh, how do I know I didn't make any mistakes? So I just 
add a chapter that says do another control because this I calculated by hand and this I control. Check check your numbers. And I can see all that thinking uh, in my um, notebook. You can also program R in a Jupyter notebook because Jupyter is short for Julia R and no, Jupyter. It's Julia, Python, and R. So you can use those three languages in Jupyter notebooks. So these arguments for these benefits of using R or Python over Excel or spreadsheets, um, they go for both Python and R. However, I'm a Pythonista, so go for Python if you ask me. But just so you know, so you can make your own decision. Um, what are the best free learning resources for Python? Is there something straightforward that one can just avoid a regular number of hours? Soon? Great question, David. Um, as I'd say if I had to, what are the best free learning? It depends on what you want to do. So I created a course myself. It's called Python for Journalists. It's on um, uh, datajournalism.com. Um, but it only gives you the very basics. So I think if you spend the weekend doing that course, if you're really into it and you want to see this phase for two more days, you can. Um, uh, but then you only know the basics. So um, I'll I'll add it in the I'll think about it. I, I need to think about this one. Uh, and then I'll add it in the Twitter thread and I'll add a link to that in the in the presentation. Um, uh, Frauke, uh, do you have a simple example for such a project, uh, a small project that you can do? Ooh, I don't know. I think, I mean, I learned the last year I celebrated half a lifetime in data in journalism, which sounds bigger than it is, but I felt it was a good thing to celebrate because I started as a teenager for the local news. And I think local news offers um, a lot of opportunities for small stories, for stories that you can actually wrap your head around. So I'd say do a data analysis, but do it for a city you know, because then if there's an odd number, you know the neighborhood that that number represents because remember data is always about people it's always about the the non-digital things surrounding you um so my first analysis was about house houses in rotterdam where i used to live um and then i saw some odd numbers i was like why are these houses so expensive that's not a fancy neighborhood so i could rely on my uh, fingers bits a good full on my nose for stories because I knew the city and not because I was such a good data journalist because I wasn't because it was my first attempt um, so I would say I don't I mean story ideas for local data driven stories they're endless can be anything totally up to where you are based and what data is available uh, but since you are all smart and creative people I'm sure you can come up with something but my advice would be pick something that you can wrap your head around because I ended up cycling with, with a couple of my friends, cycling the city on a Saturday to check on my own numbers because I could do it because it was within reach because it was just like, I think if we cycled efficiently only a two hour ride, we ended up cycling all day, having a lot of fun, but there was a way to check my own work. Um, um, in the real world, which is a luxury I now don't have. I have to do it using my analysis and making phone calls because I don't, me and my colleagues, we don't get to drive around the country to see if my numbers add up. My numbers need to add up and there's no checking it in that sense. Um, but when you're beginning, you can do yourself a favor and just check your work in the real world before publication, of course. Um, okay, um, so free resources and straightforward to just um, regular numbers of hours to, to get to a reasonable, reasonable level. I'll think about that one. And I think 
all other questions are answered, right? Date on the road. <laughs> yes, date on the road, Delphine. So nice to, so nice to have you here. Um, it was wonderful meeting you. Um, my Twitter handle is just my name, Vinny De Jong. Hit me up there. Um, I, publish a, I publish a newsletter. Oh my God, this is such a good moment for shameless self-promotion. Um, and it's called uh, Journalism News. And it's basically all the cool things, data journalism related that I saw last week when I'm not too busy. This week I was too busy because I was preparing this talk. Um, I'll make sure all the resources will be in my presentation that you can find um, at the location where uh, that Peter just posted. And um, yeah, any questions, anything else, if you think I can help, try to be, try to keep your question short and precise, but I'll, and then I'll try to do my best to help you out. Um, yes, um, looking forward to hear from you. And thank you for being here.